Hello again, welcome back. Today I'm going to show you how I modeled this cute isometric coffee shop. Here's what it's going to end up looking like by the end of this time lapse. I'm starting with a cube as usual. I'm always starting with walls and I always have the same fixed camera angle for all five scenes in this series. I want the base of the composition, the walls and the floor to be the same in all five scenes to make them look like a part of a series. I'm making sure that the walls and the floor are the same width. The same for the floor panels. These are the same height in all the images, but the designs are different. While windows is something that I change a lot scene to scene in these series. Here you can see me having fun and uh, experimenting. I was thinking of adding the glass blocks windows. I thought they would fit this nice coffee shop aesthetic really well. Because I want these five dioramas look like they belong to the same series, there are a lot of materials that I'm reusing. If you wanted to see how I made this glass material, you can check out the previous video. Here you can see me changing my mind and going from beveled glass blocks to subdivided glass blocks. Glass block that I made using subdivision surface modifier with some edge loops reminds me of a chewy candy maybe? And if anything you make looks tasty, it naturally means that it's amazing, right? Here I'm applying base colors that are going to be prevalent throughout the entire series. Dark grey, white, and I'm adding the wooden texture. It would clearly be a crime if I had this beautiful glass wall and didn't have a light shining through it. That's why I'm rotating the sheet of sky texture to have the sun shining from the right side cozy, warm, bright daylight shining through these glass blocks was the original idea, the original inspiration behind this piece. That's why it was important for me to establish this early. Later you can see I chose the accent color because it's also important. I want all of these scenes to look coherent, so I'm using the same base colors like black and white, but I'm adding one or two in the example of the kitchen that we modeled in the previous episode, accent colors that are gonna look different from picture to picture and make the rooms have their own voice, have their own feeling, have their own mood. Here I'm realizing that leaving the front side of the bar just white looks a little bit boring, so I'm adding these indentations. To do that, I selected the shortest path from one side to the other. You can do that by clicking on the first face, holding control and clicking on the last face that you want to be selected. What makes this feature really good is that you can choose how many faces you want to be selected and deselected in between. So you can choose it to be every other one, for example, or three selected, four deselected. Really convenient. Inspired by one of the coffee shops here in Tbilisi, I wanted to add a tall bar height table next to the window where you could sit and work on your laptop. As you can see on the table, I just applied the solidify modifier. Usually I wouldn't have to do that, but since I'm using a texture, it wasn't actually being applied properly to an object with a solidify modifier. And to properly apply the texture, you usually need to UV unwrap the object. UV unwrapping is basically placing the seams on a 3D object so that you can put all the faces of a 3D object onto a 2D plane that is a texture. Here on the left you see a simple UV unwrap of this wooden plank. To imagine UV unwrapping, think of those protective sticker skins that people put in their gadgets. Those are basically pre-cut out pieces of texture that you can stick to the side of your devices. And when you're UV unwrapping, you need to make the decisions where to cut this texture, where to place the seam. And the main goal is to end up with the smallest number of visible seams possible, while still maintaining the non-stretched, good-looking texture on the end model. You don't need to UV unwrap everything all the time. If you're just working in Blender, you can use shaders, you can use solid colors, like what I'm doing for the majority of the objects in the scene. You can select different faces of an object and assign multiple materials to one object this way. In game dev, you wouldn't want to do that, because every single shader is a separate draw call. So if you're working on a game asset, it's much better to UV unwrap it and make a texture that combines different colors. Here in a second you're going to notice a weird effect on the cover of the cake platter when I'm rendering it. I tried to fix the material and I didn't understand what was wrong, and only after that I realized that my normals were inverted. This is a good example why you want to keep track of your normals. 
things like regular solid materials, like I said before in my previous video, are not really affected by inverted normals in Blender. It's just inconvenient to work with when you want to do something with normals, like extrude along normals, and then it turns out that you had normals all inverted, and uh, it's just not a good time. But also it's important for rendering. For example, things like glass, like in that glass platter. Here you can see I'm modeling just one side of the chair, and then I'm gonna use the mirror modifier. I'm adding a mirror modifier using Quick Favorites add-on, and before that I used Auto Mirror, one of the add-ons that comes pre-installed with Blender and is not enabled by default, just because manually adding a mirror modifier is not really convenient, and I don't quite know why. I would prefer for mirror modifier to just work as Auto Mirror. Here I'm starting to model a laptop, because what was the last time you've been to a coffee shop and didn't see a lot of people working on something on their laptops there? As you can see to make the keyboard, I subdivided the plane a couple of times, dissolved two edges to make the space key, then used split faces by edges tool and extruded the separated faces. And bevel modifier took care of the chubby look of the keys. Briefly, I copied the keyboard from the previous office scene. I did that to figure out what the scale of the keys should be in this case, because I want these two images to look like they belong to the same world when viewed next to each other. For the same reason, I also added a cup that I modeled in the previous video about the cute mini office, and this plant that we modeled in the bathroom video. If you haven't watched this video, the link is gonna be in the description. Here I'm realizing that this terracotta color is not working with the red background, so I'm changing it to white. Also all the metals in this room are silver, that's why I decided not to keep that gold accent. Here I'm starting to work on the coffee machine. Especially when I'm modeling something this technical, I'm always looking for a lot of references. I'm not trying to replicate any particular model, just looking for inspiration and seeing which parts of the design I'm gonna enjoy. A really useful feature in Blender that I really wish I knew earlier about is being able to create a new orientation based on the selection. So here I created a new orientation based on the faces that are at an angle, and now I can just move on X, Y, Z, which are basically the local X, Y, Z axes of this face. Another useful feature that I really wish I knew earlier about is being able to bevel edges based on their weight, the weight that you can specify. First time I saw it being used was very recently in a tutorial by Nikki Blender. She was modeling an amazing isometric room. To do this, you just need to make sure that your limit method in the bevel modifier is set to weight, and then you just change the bevel weight of any edges that you want to on the right in the transform menu. By the way, if you don't see this transform thing on the right, you can press N to hide and unhide this menu. So what beveling by weight does is that it allows you to have bevels of different strength in one object. It's super convenient and you can see this is what it looks like here on the coffee machine, where the outer corners are much smoother, while the inner, more intricate details are sharper. Now that I'm happy with the general shape of the coffee machine, I'm adding smaller details like those knobs and grid on the bottom and top of the coffee machine. If you're a coffee nerd, you're definitely noticing things that are very, very wrong with this coffee machine. And in fact, I was told that nobody is allowed to stack cups on top of the coffee machine like I'm about to do here. And it just feels natural to me. I feel like this is what I've seen in a lot of coffee shops. I was told that you shouldn't do that because putting the cup on top there is done to warm up the cup before serving the drink, so stacking more than one cup to warm them up doesn't make any sense. I guess where I'm going with this is here's an example of me making a decision based on how pretty the end result is going to look like and not if that totally makes sense in the world, especially to people who actually know the subject that I'm modeling. If you're working as an illustrator, you're probably gonna make things in your life that you're not gonna be very familiar with, and a lot of people who understand the subject thoroughly are gonna be probably gonna be upset with you. But you gotta understand your audience, you gotta understand your client, you gotta know where your time is best spent. Making an image that will satisfy people who are very passionate about the subject you're working on is gonna be much more difficult than making the image that will work for the general public. 
So it's always up to you to decide who your audience is going to be and where your time is best spent. Another example, if you know something about coffee, what you're probably thinking right now is why is there a very, very expensive coffee grinder next to what is basically a coffee machine made for home use? But most people are probably not going to think that. And there is a positive side to missing something obvious. It will probably drive your social media engagement up because of all the comments telling you that you missed something obvious, you know? The last thing our coffee shop was missing was a menu. Here we go, now we can order a coffee. Thank you for watching. I really hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any questions or feedback, leave them in the comments down below. I'm gonna try to read all of them. You can also find me on social media as Julie Strader, basically anywhere. Thanks again, I'll see you in the next one. Bye!